do all things. There is nothing that is impossible for you. And we thank you that as your children, you have provided for us in every single area. We do not lack in anything. Emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, every single area you have provided for us. And we give you thanks that as your children, we will never go short. We will never be in lack. We will never experience life without the love of God. That we are forever held in your arms, in your hands. That you are always there for us. That you never turn your back on us. That whenever we speak to you, you're ready to listen. We thank you that you are the Alpha and the Omega. That you are the beginning and the end. That you know everything in between. That we can rest in you, knowing that you have a plan. That you always have a plan. That our plans, compared to your plans, sometimes we cannot even comprehend what your plan is for our life. Because it so far surpasses our expectations. So we just, today we give this service to you, God. We hand it over to you. And we invite you to speak through every single person. Not only the people at the front, not only the people with the microphones, but every conversation that takes place. We ask that your Holy Spirit leads the conversations. The answers that people were looking for will come to them today. That there will be seeds planted in people's hearts that will take root and that will grow. And that in days and months, years to come, they will see a harvest and you will remind them that it was a word that they heard today, spoken by one of their brothers and sisters. So we just give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guys, you may take your seats. So it's warm in here, isn't it? I don't normally say that, so it must be warm. Um, but at least it's not cold. That's good. So I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. And um, we have, I know we have some people that haven't been here before. So we have a small gift for you. Um, Louise, do you have a small gift for the new people? If you want to put your hand up if you've never been here before. I mean, you don't have to put your hand up because we know who you are. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Also, just welcome to those of you watching on live stream, either now or in the future. It's great to have you with us. So I'm just going to give a, a couple of notices. As usual, we have Bible study here on Wednesday, 7 o'clock. Um, if you've never been before, I'd encourage you to come. It's always really good. Um, do you know what? what? Whatever we do when the Lord's involved, it's always really good, isn't it? So come along if you're free. Next Sunday, we have the team from TKU, which is... The King's University in Texas. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting what it stands for. The King's University in Texas. They're going to be with us next Sunday. Um, they're coming with EI, European Initiative. And they're actually going to come. We, I think we've already told you this information. They're going to be with us from Saturday. So on Saturday evening, we're probably going to go down to Warsaw and just have some conversations with whoever God happens to put into our path. Have some conversations with them. Tell them about Jesus. Um, let them know that there's a different way, a better way, a God kind of way. And then on Sunday, the team are going to be here with us, and they're going to be sharing. So we've invited them to come and share their testimonies, and if they have a word from God that they'd like to bring as well. So next Sunday, um, the service is going to be mainly with the EI team and the King's University team. Um, so yeah, come along next Sunday. It's going to be good. And then those of you that are available, we're going to be in Liverpool for the two days afterwards which is Monday and Tuesday. Um, so we're going to go to Liverpool. And those of you that have been with us for a while and that have been on any mission with us, you know what we're going to do. We're just going to spend... <laughs> we're going to spend probably seven or eight hours in Liverpool city centre doing drama, dancing, preaching the gospel, just letting people know that Jesus is alive, that he's real, that, he's, that he has not passed away, that he's here today, that he's with us. And we're going to be introducing people to him. Um... You know, I was thinking about it, actually, having the team with us when I was standing there. And I was just thinking to myself, the, the word came into my head. And I don't use these Christianese words very much. But um, I was thinking of Christianity. And then the word popped into my head of churchianity. <laughs> and I was thinking, that's not, that's not a good word, you know. Because churchianity is just go to church on a Sunday, you know, have some fellowship, have some fun, go home, and do it again. And just, you know, just do church stuff, what we know as church. Whereas really, church, the body of Christ, is, it, it, it doesn't end, does it? There's no end to the service. You don't go home in general because you're the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And it was just, I was just being reminded by God that 
the mandate, the very first mandate that he gave to myself and I believe to Andrew is to, to preach the gospel to all of us as believers. You know, he says that he's given us the ministry of reconciliation, hasn't he? Every single one of us. And it just reminded me that we love this building. We love the church family. We love what God's doing. But we also know that if we just stay inside the building, there's so many people out there that are never going to experience what he has for them. So we're excited because when God sends people, wherever they're from, do you know, you know he's sending them for a reason. He's not done it just for fun. He's not done it by accident. So we're expectant it's going to be a good few days next weekend. And then just to keep it in your minds as well, 12th of July, we have Mission 24 with us. We're going to give you more information about this. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's going to be amazing. Um, if, you've, if you don't know Mission 24, if you've never done anything with them, um, they are awesome. The guy heading it up, Jonathan Comrath, is, is very on fire for, for the Lord, for the gospel, for evangelism, for, for just telling people, do you know what I mean? Just letting people know that we have this awesome, good thing, and we want you to have it too. So um, it's going to be really good. That's starting on the 12th of July, and we will give you a lot more information about that. And then straight after that, don't forget, we're going to Spain. And I can see some people in the room that are coming to Spain with us. There's still time if you want to come to Spain. We're not going on holiday, by the way. <laughs> this is a mission trip for seven days. We're going to be in a place called San Javier. So if you fancy coming along, talk to us. We can fill you in on some details. Um, and then all that's left to say is that we will take an offering at the end of the service during worship at the end. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hand over to a visitor that we have with us today whose name is Errol. He's from Canada. Well, he lives in Canada. And I'll let him do the rest of his introducing because I don't know him well enough. So if you'd like to come up here, Errol. Thank you, Selena. Good morning, everyone. I became a little nervous when she said she's going to hand over. <laughs> hand over the service. But it is so good to be with you and to be able to uh, share with you this morning. I am here uh, at the home of my loving sister, Sharon. And this visit has been long overdue. And then to make it twice as good, my brother Fred is also here with us. And... <laughs> I can't remember being together with both of you for the longest while, together in one place. You know, so this is really, really a special uh, time for me, notwithstanding that I'm here on a bereavement trip. My aunt, my eldest aunt passed, and so we're going to be uh, supporting the family this uh, Tuesday at her funeral service. So Selena and her precious husband, Andrew, has asked me to share with you my testimony, I've not done this for a long time. Yeah. But I will, I will share with my, my testimony and they'll give you just a word of encouragement. It's good to be with you, Andrew and Selena, and uh, just to listen to your heart for the gospel, your heart for missions, because that's what the church is about. And I sense that the Lord has put you two together. And I am just waiting to see and to hear the amazing things that God will do through you and through Keystone. So our prayers are with you, and I, I'll be listening for what your accomplishments will be. So I was, um, I'm from the island of Jamaica, and um, uh, God saved at about 16, 17 years old. Uh, I am a member of the Church of God. The Church of God is um, internationally headquartered in Cleveland, Tennessee. It's a Pentecostal church. And um, my mom took us to church. You know, she got saved when I was about five or so and took us to church uh, every week. And as I, was, I was, as I was coming into my teen years, I would hear her pray for me. And I thought she was wasting her time because I was not on the, the Jesus track. But she would pray for me and I, I, I would hear her praying for me and coming into uh, about 16 or so in my high school years, the Lord began to work in my heart. And I'm going to talk to you probably about two or three things that I think are, for me, watershed moments in my journey with him. So he began working in my heart, and um, it wasn't as dramatic as Selena's. I want to hear your testimony because I hear that you have this, this real bombshell testimony, right? 
uh, mine was much more subdued. He began working in my heart and drawing me towards him. And on a Saturday morning at a men's, a young men's uh, prayer meeting in a little room at our church, uh, I knelt before him. And I remember having this, uh, my first experience with Jesus where I saw him, I actually believe I saw him on the cross, uh, beckoning to me. He, he wasn't in pain. He, it didn't appear to be in pain. But I remember seeing just the love in his eyes, and he called out to me and basically said to me, it is time. So I got saved when I was about 17. And then I jumped in with both feet and both hands into, into, into a relationship with Christ. I remember that morning as I was going home, we took the public transport, and I felt I was in, on cloud nine. I think I was out of this world. And the Lord began to work in me and to draw me towards him. And the first thing I started doing, which was really nuts for a 17-year-old, was that I bought a commentary, a Bible commentary, and started devouring the word, not knowing that the Lord was putting me into, he was preparing me for ministry. And so I bought my first commentary. It was Matthew Henry, a devotional commentary. You guys know about Matthew Henry. And then my mom uh, got me through the Bible with Vernon McGee. I think Sharon knows about Vernon McGee. And I just devoured, 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 devoured the word of God. Jumped into youth ministry. I love young people. It's messy ministry, but it's great ministry. And um, so I, I went into my youth group. And I'm giving it to you very short and sweet. And then I went to uh, Trinidad, to the University of the West Indies, to study. I uh, have a first degree in, agro in ag agriculture. And then I started working with university, uh, IVCF, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and been in that ministry. In that ministry, I learned to accept and to be a part of a multi-ethnic, multicultural Christian environment where you have people from various denominations, various countries. And that taught me that the body of Christ is organic wherever it is. Wherever you are, you are a part of the body. Of Christ. Just about, just after I got saved, something that I was talking to Fred about it this morning, my dad was shot. He, he was a peddler, cursing oil peddler, and he was uh, shot right behind the ears and nearly died. And I remember at the time being very angry, and I decided that I wanted to join the police force because I wanted revenge on the fellows that did that. Fast forward, in my first pastoral assignment, that location where the Lord took me to pastor church was the very property that his truck, when he got shot, his truck ran back from a, an incline, a hill, ran right into that property. On the property was a brothel, when I got there, there was a church and the old brothel, the house was still there. But the Lord brought me back to that spot. And that is where my ministry began. I'll give you another watershed moment. You guys might like to hear this. My wife, her name is Faye. I was driving on the road one day in Jamaica. I'd, I'd lost my job and I was driving on the road one day. And the Lord, out of the blue, I... You know, you don't like to talk about hearing the Lord's voice. You, don't want, you, you need to be very careful with that, right? I'm very careful with it. But out of the blue, he said to me, son, you have never spoke to me and told me what, uh, about your wife. What, what wife do you want? After I got married, I'm going to give you the whole details. My wife told me that years before, a pastor of her, an old gentleman, said to her, she had gotten saved and within one month of getting saved, she went to Bible school. And he said to her, allow her to come into the Bible school because the Lord, she's going to get married to a pastor. And so I give you just a little tidbits, right, about my life. So I'm a pastor. I pastor a church of about 300 or so people. I've been in pastoral ministry since about 1992. Pastored about four churches. I've planted one church. By the way, you're doing exciting work here, right? And the Lord has just, um, I don't know, he has just given me this watershed moment that allow me to know 
that he has a personal plan for my life. And I want to encourage you, each of you sitting here, God has a plan for your life, a personal plan, a personal blueprint. And he does not show you the whole plan at the get-go. In fact, you will have to walk in that plan day by day. One of the things that I had in my blueprint, and two of them are sitting there, is that since the Lord saved me, I've been praying for my family for 40, how many, over nearly 50 years. And I've seen them come to faith one by one. I was talking to Sharon just this week, and she was relating to me how she got saved in Texas. I'm hearing the story, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, thank you. That was on my prayer list. That was on my prayer agenda. So God has a plan for your life, and he has a plan for your family. I'll just leave something with you. Um, and I'm, not, I'm not over my time yet, am I? I'll leave something with you. In John chapter number 5, the Lord, uh, John gives us a story. The Lord going into um, the pool of Bethesda. The story is about this man who was sick for 38 years. He was with sick people laying there for 38 years, it would appear. And Jesus goes to him and he asks him the question, do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? And he healed this man. He spoke to him. He told him, take up your bed and walk. The first thing I want to say to you is that God loves you. Amen. He is a, he's a good God. He's a God of love. He's a God who desires to do something positive in your life. And you may be in your situation for a long time. And it may seem as if God has not answered your prayers. He has forgotten you. But I want to remind you that he loves you. He has a plan. He's a good God. A good, good father. And you should expect good things from him. Ask him for good things. Depend on him for good things. And have faith in him for good things in your life. And it does not matter how difficult and how long and how dark your valley experience has been. He is always good. Amen? He's a good God. They asked him this question, the religious people. They were really, really angry with him because he did this good thing on the Sabbath. And they had their own ideas about the Sabbath. They had, they had added their tradition to the law of God, the word of God. They had corrupted the word of God with their own traditions. You cannot do anything to deserve God's goodness. You cannot work for God's goodness. You cannot be religious for his goodness. What you have to do is to trust him. And so they were angry with him. And Jesus said this to them. My father has been working until now and I have been working. They were saying to him, you should not have done this on the Sabbath day. But if you need something from God, he will do it. Amen. It doesn't have to be uh, on your agenda, on your right time. He is a good God. And he's always working. The song says you may not see it, you may not feel it, but he's working for your good. And if you could just uh, tap into that, amen, you will discover that he's working for your good. The last thing I will say to you is, from what he said is this. He says this in John chapter 5 and verse 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father doing. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. And the last thing I will say is this. From what he says, Jesus is not only our savior, he is our model. And the relationship that he had with his father is the relationship that he wants you and I to have with the father as well. And he says this. He says, not only is my father working, I am also working. But he says, I do only what I see my father doing. 
In other words, it is out of his relationship with the Father. Jesus was a man just like you. He was a God-man, but he operated out of a relationship with God. He had a connection with his Father, an ongoing connection. And so I want to encourage you to stay connected with God. I can tell you sometimes I don't feel as connected because maybe I sinned. You know, I, did, you know, I fell off the wagon, did things I'm not supposed to do. And sometimes you feel that you can't go to God. You can't talk to him. But can I tell you that he, Ephesians number one says that he, he holds you before him in love. Because you are in the beloved. In that same passage it says that you are accepted in the beloved. And the beloved is Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are accepted. Hebrews 4.16, come boldly before his throne to find grace and mercy in the time of need. And so I want to encourage you, irrespective of the ups and downs of your journey with Christ, irrespective of the, the, the thrust and the cut of that journey and the days with, on your worst days, he will hear. In your worst time, he will hear. So stay connected with him. And when you stay connected with him, if you spend time with him, he will show you what he's doing. Jesus says, I only do the things that I see my father doing. And you don't have to be some pastor or some you know, big shot in the church. All you have to be is a child of God. And he will show you. Over time, you'll begin to understand and to know him. Amen? And to know when he talks to you. The anointing is a flow. It is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing. And so staying connected with God, you will hear him as you pray, as you worship. By the way, worship attracts his attention. I love your worship. I loved it in Caris, and I loved it here today. Amen. He will speak to you. And so it is a present, and thing, a present tense thing for God. Stay connected with him. Worship him. And no matter what, he loves you. Thank you. Amen. Awesome testimony. Thank you, Errol. Do you know, isn't it, we say this all of the time, whenever somebody gets up and then we're going to follow on, there is so much in what you've said that I'm going to say. And even in the prayer this morning, there's so much in what you've said that connects to what we spoke about this morning in prayer. So thank you very much. Awesome. It's great to get to know people and to find out their journey and, and what God is doing in them. So are you ready for the word, even though you've had some word, you've had a, you've had a taster before, beforehand. <laughs> so today we're going to be speaking about faith. Awesome. You don't seem excited. <laughs> As we've just been told by brother, faith is the thing. Faith is the thing. So if you turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews 11, and we're going to read verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> and it says this now faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen for by them or by it sorry the elders obtained a good testimony by faith we understand that the worlds were formed by the word of God so that the things which are seen the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though and sorry, and through it he being dead still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony 
that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Amen. So, Father God, we just thank you for your word today. We thank you, Father, that by faith we enter into the promises that you have for us, Father. And so, Father, as I continue to speak your word, Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would empower the words, Father God, and will touch the heart of those that hear it now in the future, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So what is faith? Faith is something that you hear about so much. It is this, it is that, it's something else. Maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And you find yourself in a place where you're searching for this, what's the word I'm looking for? This uh, a bit like the Scarlet Pimpernel. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Scarlet Pimpernel. It says they seek him here, they seek him there, and they seek him everywhere. <laughs> but they can rarely find him. And so this is what faith is. We're told that we are to live to walk, to breathe by faith. But we don't know what it is. And we don't know how to attain it. So we think anyway. So this is my take on what faith is. Faith is a seed that contains the substance that will eventually create the outcome you are hoping for. Okay? Okay? So faith is a seed that contains the substance that will eventually create the outcome you are hoping for. In Romans 10:17 it says this. So faith comes from what is heard. This is the Christian standard bible. Faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Man. So faith comes through a specific message. You know, I've, I've heard it before and I've spoken it before myself. You know, just read the Bible and it will increase your faith. That's not true at all. The Word of God is the breathed Word of God and I, I'm completely agreeing with that. But faith only comes through a certain part of that message and that message is the life the death and burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ this is where faith comes from so often we read the Bible and I'm, I'm, people have read Job and Exodus and these the, you know and this all points to Jesus but it is not what brings faith what will bring us faith is hearing the gospel of the life, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to me? Amen. I need encouragement, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, another version of that Romans ten seventeen says this. So, faith comes by hearing and hearing in the word of God. So, the message we need to hear is about the life of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And then what he accomplished when he died and rose again. When we hear that, it's called the gospel. The gospel is the good news. As Errol was speaking, all of these things have been accomplished. And we don't receive them because of who we are. We receive them because of where we are. Think about that for a second. It's not because of who you are. It's because of where you are. It's your position in Christ that opens the door to the blessings of God in your life. So, once we've heard the true gospel of Jesus Christ, faith grows in a heart where conviction and belief are found. And then, it's accompanied by corresponding actions. So faith without works is, is dead. So you can tell me you have faith, but I can see by your actions whether or not you're in faith or not. So, what is the heart? It's, it's another one of these 
grey areas that we find ourselves in. So we're finding ourselves in faith. So we're trying to find out what faith is. But what is the heart? Because it tells us that if you don't believe in your heart, then faith can't come. So what is faith? So Javier, can you... Sorry, what is the heart? Sorry. So Javier, can you put that picture for me, please, if you would? Now, this is my illustration of the heart. I think it's pretty good, actually. I think it's pretty good. It, it took me a little while to get it, but it's good. Now, look at this, guys. We all know about spirit, soul, and body, yeah? Well, if we don't, that will be explained to you as, as we go along. And I'm going to look here because it's nice and big. So at the top, we have the spirit. This is our new born-again spirit, if you're, if you're a born-again believer. We have the soul here at the bottom uh, left, yeah, your left, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, okay? And then on the far right there, we have the body. And they're all connected because obviously I'm not three circles. <laughs> but you can see me as a person. I've got a, a body, I've got a mind, a will, and emotions, and I've got a spirit. Where all of those connect, yeah? is where you find your heart. It's not the, the pumping organ in, inside my chest, but it's where your spirit, your soul, and your body connect. That's where you find your heart. And that is the place where you do your believing. Okay? Your believing is not in your head, even though you might think it is. It's really not. So that's where your heart is. So I hope that's cleared it up for you, because it cleared it up for me. Okay, so let's have a look at Abraham. We all know Abraham. He was the father of faith. Amen. So Romans 4, 18 to 22. And again, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It will probably come from a different translation. Romans 4, 18, Javier. They were talking about Abraham now. He believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations according to what had been spoken to him so will your descendants be he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body to be already dead since he was about a hundred years old and also the deadness of Sarah's womb he did not waver in unbelief at God's promise but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to do. Therefore, it was credited to him, credited to him for righteousness. There's so much in this scripture here. So much, man alive. Now, I just want to touch on it quickly and then I'm going to move, move on. He believed hoping against hope. And I read that and I was like, what does that mean? And as God was unveiling it, the scripture when it says Jesus is talking to the father of the son who had uh, epilepsy and he says to Jesus I believe help my unbelief yeah yeah and so I spoke about it again this morning as 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 we walk this path of uh, as a Christian you know relationship with Jesus there's always the opposite alongside us so he had belief but he also had unbelief here, Abraham is hoping, because he heard the word from God, he's hoping. But on the other side of that, his, his eyes are seeing his wife. His eyes are seeing himself. And it's hopelessness, because man alive, how can I have a, chil a child when I'm 100 years old? My wife is 90. This is just, and so there was the hoping and there was the hopelessness. But it says here, he did not weaken in faith. Why? Because he didn't consider his own body. Guys, so important. If you're standing on a word from God, you cannot use your five senses to determine where you are. If you do that, then you're not believing what God said. If you do that, they will distract you, they will confuse you, and they will give you a misleading um, report of where you really are so here it says he didn't consider his own body dead and his wife Sarah he didn't waver with unbelief this man was standing firm 
God had said it, I don't believe in it. Even though his eyes saw something different. I mean, I'm, there must have been people around him when he, when he conveyed that message. Me and Sarah, we're going to have a baby. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm sure you are. <laughs> and so there was a chance he could have considered the circumstances. Do not consider your circumstances because God is greater than your circumstances. Amen. So he didn't waver in unbelief. And then, as our friend Errol was saying, he gave glory to God. Man, he spent evenings in his tent worshipping and thanking God for the promise that he couldn't see with his physical eyes. But he knew the God who had said it was faithful. Amen to that. So he did not waver, but he gave glory to God. Why? Because, number 21, he was fully convinced. He was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to, able to do. So, he stood, and because of that belief, it was what? It was um, given to him, as credit to him as righteousness. Amen? Amen. He became the father of faith. He didn't have Jesus. He didn't have the word. He didn't, he didn't know about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. So what he did was he took the word from God only and stood on that word. He stood on that word. So, as I said, faith is a seed that contains the substance of your future. Even God, when he spoke, had to use faith. Come on. I mean, I can imagine him sitting thinking, about the future, about the world, about people, about you and about me. What did he do? He spoke it out, believing, using his faith, that what he couldn't see was going to be made real for him. So if he needs to do it and did it, how much more do we need to, to, to have this in our mind when we do it? So faith is real and faith is now. Because you can't see it, you think it's not there. But it tells us it's not visible. It's in a realm where it's not visible. But it is the substance that makes the visible real. It's so good. It's so good. So even with the heart, as I showed you the heart, you can't feel it. You can't see it. But it's there. And it's where we take our, where we make our biggest beliefs. It's physical. So, yeah, okay. So, faith is this. It's a seed with substance. The word substance is this. It's real matter. Yeah? It's, which could be a person or a thing that consists of a tangible, solid presence. So it's real. It's just that we can't see it right now. So I'm going to show you a clip. I'm going to step to one side. Have you? Do you have it ready? Okay. So this clip is from the film, uh, from uh, the episode, The Chosen. Have you guys watched The Chosen before? You ever watched it? Yeah. Okay. Who says no? Uh, so a couple of, okay. There's a couple of people up there. That's fine. It's no problem. So this is from The Chosen, and this is where Peter, the Apostle Peter, he wasn't known as that back then, meets Jesus for the first time. Okay. If you play that. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. That's your word.
My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long, we believe. But my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. Awesome. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Javier. So, Peter, you got a blast from the Lord. <laughs> Do you know, it, what I was, when I was watching that, I realized that that miracle was actually the faith of Jesus that was being used. It wasn't the faith of, of anybody else. And I love the way when, when, when the boat's filling up, Jesus looks up at, at, at God and he's kind of like, <laughs> and this is what it's like, isn't it? Even Jesus then, and there's a couple of other places in, in the chosen where he, he does a miracle and he, and he kind of looks up and he's just kind of like, as you, as you were saying, this is what I'm saying, the relationship between Jesus and his father. Now hear this now. The relationship between Jesus and his father was, um, was faith. Yeah? There, the substance was the fish. Where faith is, there's always going to be substance. There's always going to be a substance to your faith. I mean, again, we were just talking earlier. When he said what he said, there wasn't an instant manifestation. I mean, it was quick. <laughs> but it wasn't an instant. And it talks about in Mark 4, it says, the seed, time, and harvest. You know? Whatever we are in faith for, there has to be, as, as Julio put the word earlier, a gesta gestation process where if you, are, if, you, if you become pregnant as a woman, there's a time that the baby grows inside of you. At first, there's no evidence that you're pregnant. Zero. Even the woman isn't sure. But then a few weeks, maybe a few months later, the woman knows, but nobody else knows. So she's pregnant and she's walking around and people are talking. She knows she's pregnant, but nobody else knows. And then there comes a point where you start to see the baby growing. And so now we know and we see. And then comes the point where the baby is born and there it is. Faith is exactly the same. 
faith has to be grown, has to be planted into your heart first when nobody sees. When nobody sees. It's just you and the Father. And as time goes by, there's an excitement. Abraham, he said, he didn't waver. He just stood. He, he heard the word from God and he stood and he walked. He saw no children. He saw no um, descendants. But he kept walking and standing until Isaac arrived. And then there was a manifestation. And still you could say, well, you said many nations. There's only one person standing here. But we, now looking back, we see the full story. If you're in faith today for anything at all, if you're believing God, there has to be a period of time when it's just you and him. Just like when Peter fell at, at the feet of Jesus. There was, I can guarantee when Peter was speaking to Jesus, there was nobody else around. It was just him and Jesus. And when he got that revelation of who Jesus was, listen to this now, when he got that revelation of who Jesus was as he walked with him for three years, he then started to use his own faith. God will never have you use your faith, even though you have it, until you get to know him. The more you get to know him, the more you'll use your own faith because you know how good he is. It's the faith that he gave you. He wants you to use it. He doesn't want you to continue to go to him and ask him and ask him and ask him. He wants you to use your faith because you know he will supply exactly what you've asked him for because he's a good father. Just the way Jesus did. He stood in, you know, at, the, at the, the tomb of Lazarus and he said he looked up to heaven and the first thing he said was, thank you, Father, that you hear me and that you always hear me. Come on. There is a relationship when he knew he was heard. With no, there's no, nothing there to say, this is going to work. And the people looking around thinking, okay, this guy's been in there four days. You know, he stinks. Don't, please do not move that stone away. But Jesus knew, because of his relationship with, with the Father, that the faith he had was going to become evident when that man walked out of that tomb. This is where we need to get to, people. This is where we need to get to. It's awesome. Absolutely awesome. So it all comes from a relationship with the Father. The more we get to know him, the more we start to rely that's all right, on him. But we start to use our own faith in that. I'm doing stuff now, today, with my wife that I wouldn't have done five years ago. <laughs> I'm believing in things today that I wouldn't have believed in a year ago. And I'm seeing the manifestation of things happening today that I would have said to you a couple of years ago, this is never going to happen. Never going to happen. And today I'm seeing it. We, uh, here we are. We're sitting in, in that one of, those <laughs> one of those faith moments. Let me just tell you, um, we prayed. My, me and my wife stood up on stage in our old building that we were renting. And my wife made a statement that we will be in our new building before the end of January. This was in September? September, the year before. So she's saying, she's prophesying September, October, November, December, January. She's prophesying five months into the future that by the end of January next year, we'll be in our new building. We took the keys for this place on the 28th of January, 29th. Yeah, but it was our, it was our building though, that's what I'm saying. Bef just, be I mean, days before the end of January. What is that? That standing on the word that God said to us in August that you're going to have a new building. Come on, man. This is what you do. And I'm going to just make this disclaimer. I've heard people say, Glab it, uh, <laughs> blab it and grab it. You do not blab and grab the promises of God. You know, I, I, the first church I went to 20 odd years ago, there was a, a guy and we were talking. I said to him, what are you doing the weekend, you know, on, on Saturday? He said, um, I'm going to the Mercedes showroom. And I said, oh, that's nice. He said, yeah. He said, I'm going to lay my hands on the car that I want. But this is where we were. This is what we were being taught by the pastor. That if you want it, you pray, you go and put your hands on it, and you believe, and then you'll receive it. Which is not true at all. That's not what faith is. But this is what some people will tell you. 
And I can just say for record, he still doesn't have his Mercedes. 20 odd years later, he's <laughs> the paint's been worn off the car, but he still hasn't got his car. <laughs> but this is what it is. You know, faith is real. And when we take it into that kind of ooh, spiritual place, we lose it. We, lo we lose hold of what it is. It says we've been given the measure of faith. So that's in us right now. But what do you really believe? Is that seed? We talk about Mark 4. I'm going to read some of Mark 4 as well. It says the seed, the first was scattered and it landed on hard ground. The second, there were thorns. The third, no, sorry, the second, there was only a shallow, a shallow amount of dirt. The third, there were thistles. And that was the cares of the world. But the fourth ground was, was good ground. And it, and it received the harvest. Three, six, and, and, and a hundredfold. You know? Where are you today with your faith? Where are you with your believing? You have the measure of faith. You need no more faith. The faith you have can move the mountain that's in your life today. But where are you putting that faith? Where are you going to put it? And it's got into your heart what I showed you where the belief system is where your mind, your will, and your emotions, your, your spirit with the truth in it of the word of God, the promises, and the, the fact that Jesus died to give you everything that you, that you need. And when you believe in that place, you see a manifestation in your body, in your, your bank account, in your relationships, in your mind. And this is the evidence that the faith that you have is real. Amen? This is good, man. This is good. I'm, this is very good, very good. Let me see where I want to go. Okay. Romans 10, 8 to 13 says this. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The word is in your heart. What word is that? The word of faith, my brother. Exactly right. It's in your heart. This is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever... Whoever, not just the Christians, but whoever, believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Come on, man, this is awesome. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, I'm, I'm going to read it out. You see the word of, this is what I've written down. You see the word of God is a seed that contains a substance called faith. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that on that cross, it said just before he went on the cross, he was beaten so you could be made well. He took on all of your infirmities onto that cross so you could be made whole. He was made poor, so you could be made rich. He lost everything so we could gain everything. When you hear these words and that you now do nothing to deserve it, you do nothing to receive it, this is good news. Because you cannot pay for what he's going to give you. You cannot do enough. You cannot fast enough. You cannot pray enough. There's nothing that we can do to receive what he has died for. Amen? That's the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you hear those words, that right now you are healed, that right now you are prosperous, that right now you are whole, that right now you are free, when you hear these words, faith is birthed in you. Man. Man. When that faith is birthed birth in you, it talks about in Hebrews, it says, we have an anchor, yeah, to our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions that goes behind the veil. 
And this is, this is the picture that God gave me about that. So imagine there's a chain that's going from your mind into the heavenly places behind the veil. And the chain is connected to the mercy seat of, of Jesus. Yeah? So wherever I go, wherever I look, the chain is fixed. It doesn't matter where I go in my, in my life. The chain is fixed onto the mercy seat. And as I continue to believe, the chain brings the unseen into the scene. It's awesome. So that chain, it says, is connected to the mercy seat. Yeah? And now I keep believing, I keep standing on the word of faith that I've received from the Father. And as I keep to believe, and I keep believing, as I keep walking, it's getting closer and closer and closer. And it's brought into reality. And I see the manifestation, the substance of faith in my life. Faith is not up and down. It's not wishy-washy. It's just one thing. It's just one thing. And you have exactly what you need right now. The measure, the amount, you have it now. You just need to know where to put it. He says, put it in your heart. And when you believe, you start to walk. And as you start to walk, it says, it starts to sprout. Because the earth produces after itself. Your heart produces after itself. Again, Proverbs um, 23, 7 says, as a man believes in his heart, so is he. As you believe, you start to walk in that and you start to receive. It's not magic, but it is the power of the word. The power of the word. It is good. And I've just I've actually written this down. It's uh, Mark 4, 26. <clears throat> So verse 28 says, the earth yields crops by itself. By itself. First the blade, then the head, and after that, the full corn in the head. There is a process that you go through. After you've planted a seed, there's a bit of time, and then you see the small, then a bit more time, it gets a bit bigger, and as time goes on, you reap your harvest. Okay, this is good. Is everybody happy? It's very quiet out there. Everybody's listening. Mm. <laughs> so, in, in Mark, a few chapters before, it said that the disciples, they fed the 5,000, they did this, they did that, and God, and Jesus, sorry, did many miracles that day. And at the end of all that, he said to them, we'll go in to the other side and he went off to pray he said I'll, I'll meet you over there why not be ever asked him you know how are you going to get over there anyway so he went off to pray they got into the boat and off they went and it says this in verse number 35 it should be um chapter four still verse 35 yes that's correct it says on the same day when evening had come he said to them, Jesus, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat. So this is Jesus now. He's in the boat with them. And other little boats were also with him. A great windstorm arose and the waters beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Okay. Okay. So it was already filling. So it wasn't going to be filled. It was already filling. So they were sinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, could say, you could actually say that they were sinking. Yeah. So Jesus is, is sleeping. The, the disciples are rowing. The boat is sinking. Okay. Do we get the picture? The boat's sinking. Okay. And it says, so, and Jesus, he said, but he was asleep in the stern on a pillow. <laughs> And we, we know all the stories, he's sloshing around and all the water. And Was he awake? Was he asleep? I don't know. It says he, he said he was sleeping, so I'll go with that. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? As far as I'm concerned, Jesus is in the same boat with them. So he's perishing as well. But they're concerned about themselves. It said, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. 
and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they, were fear, they, they feared exceedingly and said one to another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They had seen miracles that day, many miracles. But as Mark 4 says, the seed fell on the ground. They hadn't chosen to take what they had seen and plant it into their heart. They looked when the wind was going and the water was filling the boat and the boat was sinking. They chose at that moment to react to their five, six senses, five senses, six senses, their five senses, their five senses. What they see, hear, smell, taste and feel. Yes, that's right, yeah, that's right. They didn't take the word, let us go to the other side and plant it into their heart. They chose to look at the storm. Abraham, on the other hand, chose to take the word, to plant it into his heart, and it said he considered not his own body being dead. There was a place where we need to get to, friends, where I need to get to, where we need to get to, where the circumstances of your last failure does not determine your next step. Did you get that? If your last failure determines your next step, then you will not move. Abraham would not have moved if he would have looked at his body, and looked at Sarah, and considered what he'd just come from, or where, where he lived. He had a place where his family were, he had grounds, he had people working for him, he had all of these things. And God said, get up and leave your family and go. If you consider your last failure, you will not take another step. Faith is a seed that contains your future. When God gives you a word, you take the faith, you plant it into your heart, and you go. That's it. I know it sounds really easy. <laughs> and, I'm, and I appreciate we're all in different places. But that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to take the word, plant the seed, and go. And let the seed do its work. Amen? Amen. I'm going to land this plane very shortly. I'm just going to finish with this. This is Matthew 8, 5 to 13. And again, this is Jesus. We know the centurion, the centurion comes to him and he says, my, my servant is sick. And Jesus says, I will come and heal him for you. And this is what the, the centurion says to him. Lord, my servant, this is uh, verse number six. Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible, uh, uh, in terrible um, agony, sorry. So he looked at the circumstances. That was the first thing he did. Yeah? So he knew what the circumstances were. There's a man lying at home, paralyzed, in agony. He said to him, Jesus, am I to come and heal him? And the centurion says this, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So this is what I've written here now. What that man is saying to Jesus is, I get it. I get it. How you operate in the supernatural is exactly the same way I operate in the natural. You have authority in the supernatural. I have authority in the natural. And he goes on to explain that to him. That is the knowledge of where we need to get to. 
you, you said it earlier. We have been blessed, not because of who we are, but because of where we are, because of our position. This man is saying, I have authority on the earth because of my position. You have authority supernaturally in the heavenly places because of your position. Your faith is activated through your position. Anybody born again here? So your position determines the blessing that God is going to put on you. And then when I read the word, it tells me I've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. So because of my position, the faith that I now put into Jesus is going to be by the Father acknowledged and then played out in my life. Not because of me, but because of my position in Christ. So our faith is activated by believing. So we believe, says when we believe in our heart, we receive. So now we've received faith. Our position has been moved from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now because of that position, everything I go to the king and ask for is given to me because I'm an heir. I'm a son or a daughter. So what is it that you need today? What are you asking for? As a slave or as a son or daughter? Because how you ask, how you, it says, go, 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 um, we, we walk boldly into his throne room. So how do, you, how do you approach him? Are you on your knees begging? Like Peter, Peter, you don't know who I am, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Depart from me. Or do you walk to him as a son and daughter, knowing your position, knowing that the reason I've said this to you guys is not for my benefit, it's because he always answers me. The reassurance that Jesus could stand outside that tomb and shout, Lazarus, come forth. With all of those people watching, that 100% assurance that the Father was going to do what he asked. Where are we today? This is not about condemnation. It's about realisation. Realising that we are children. We are sons and daughters and we are heirs to the kingdom. And he has so many good things for us. And as, as our brother said earlier, all we have to do is ask. We go boldly to his throne and we say, Father, I'm in need. And he says, daughter, son, what do you need? And you tell him. And you're reassured as you walk away that your father has heard your petition and is willing to fulfill your petition. Not because of who you are, but because of where you are. Your position in Christ. Amen. So if you'd like to stand with me, I'm going to pray. And just, just give us a chance just to, to, to worship and just to thank him for what he's done for us. So Father, I just thank you for the word today. I thank you that your faith, Father God, is a part of your atoning sacrifice that was uh, fulfilled on the cross by your son Jesus, Father. I thank you that in, in the position that we are in right now, Father, we are free to come boldly to your throne. And to make our petitions made known to you, Father God, in time of need. And that, Father, as we plant that seed of faith into our heart, the word, the word of God, Father, which is true, Father, it will grow and it will produce a harvest, Father. We will see that substance being manifested in our lives, in our bodies, in our bank accounts, in our relationships, Father God, in every area of our life because we are in your son, Jesus, Father. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are a good God, that you are faithful, that the Holy Spirit is in this place speaking to people right now, Father. Even on live stream, Father God, there are people being touched right now by your Holy Spirit. 
as they have heard the word today, Father. And so as we come before you, Father, we open our hearts to you and we just cry, Abba, Father. We love you, Father. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for today, Father. Amen, 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 amen. So we are going to open the front up to you for prayer, if anybody would like some prayer at the end of the service. I think my wife is going to come now and just close the service. So I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope that's helped you. And bless you all. Amen. Amen. Um, praise God. <laughs> uh, we, we are going to worship now. So Andrew gets this off ready with his guitar. Um, do you know what? God's good, isn't he? You know, the one thing that um, always strikes me is that I grew up not a Christian. I grew up not understanding who God was and having no relationship with him. But in my not knowing who, who he was, I also thought when I thought of God that he was very complicated. I thought, you know, this God, the God thing is complicated. The God thing is difficult. It's something you need to understand, something you need to, to work out. It's something that you've got to strive to attain, you know. In my mind, it was something you've got to be a better person before you're going to ever be able to have any part in it. And then after becoming born again, actually after hearing the gospel spoken correctly, the truth of the gospel, and receiving it, and then realizing that actually the word of God is quite simple. You know, God didn't make it difficult. He didn't write, you know, he didn't inspire the Bible to be written in such a difficult way that we have to beg and plead and sit down and try and be like, God, what does this mean? He actually made it quite simple that when we read it alongside the Holy Spirit, when he reveals to us what these truths mean, that actually the word of God gives us instructions. It's like having an instruction book for life. You know, sometimes I hear people saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of this situation. And a lot of the times it is people that are not believers. And trying to explain to them, I had a conversation with one lady this week, not face to face, but over social media, just had a conversation where in my head it was so simple. What, what the problem was and how to solve it. But then I realized that until somebody comes to God, until somebody says, you know what, I believe, you know, I, I, I need you, I, Jesus, I want you in my life, until that veil's removed from their eyes, it is so difficult, so difficult to understand how to live in this world. But just listening to, to Andrew, and you know what, we don't, whenever Andrew writes a message, whenever I write a message, I don't listen to it until today. He doesn't listen to me until, well, actually he does because I make him, but still. Um, so I don't, I don't ever listen to, to Andrew. And sometimes I just sit there and it's not that I'm listening to Andrew. I'm just listening to the word. And I'm thinking, you know what? It's actually so simple. And we make it so difficult. I don't know about you guys, but I make it so difficult. And then the Holy Spirit reminds me, what are you doing? It's like I just said, do this and this. You know, you're already my child. You're, you already belong to, to God. You already have all those things. Just believe. You know, the, the word of God, I, I don't know, do you know what, I'm not trying to get to anything here, but just to remind us that the word of God is not difficult. You know, that living as a child of God is not difficult. We make it difficult because we add so much to it. We think we're so clever. <laughs> we're like, yeah, but what about this? And God's like, well, what about that? It is so simple. So, you know, just as we worship now, I just want to invite all of us to just get rid of all that stuff that's in your head, you know, all of those things that you're thinking about, and just let God speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit remind you of his word. Not what we think, you know, not how we try and interpret it, but the simple, pure word of God. Do you know, because when God says something, that's it. That's what he means. We don't have to try and work it out. We just have to let the Holy Spirit reveal what he's saying. So just while we're worshiping, I just invite you to let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Do you know, I'm sure we all have questions. Do you know, we all have situations, circumstances, things that we're, we're looking for an answer to. And God has the answer. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. We just need to allow it to be simple. And stop trying to, to work it all out. So we're going to worship now. And I think during the, the last song or the second song or the, the second song, we are going to take an offering as well. So, you know, we're just going to, you know, don't feel obliged to give, you know. Giving, giving is worship as well. Giving is just, just saying, just reaffirming that we are children of God. And that as we give of our finances, we can do it knowing that he's our father. And that we, what we give away, he's not saying, what did you give that away for? You need it. He's saying, you know what, pray, you know, 
pray, praise the Lord. He's saying praise the Lord. No, that's God. How's he saying praise the Lord? But anyway, he's saying, you know what? He's saying, thank you, my child. You trust me. Because giving's not about, here's my money. Take it and do something amazing with it. Giving's about, you know what? God's my father and I have this, this money in my hand and I want to give it to further the kingdom knowing that my father is going to provide for me. It's an act of worship to say that, God, I trust you. I know that whatever I have is yours. And I know that whatever I need, you're going to supply. So we're going to take an offering during the, the second song. But I'm going to finish talking now because otherwise we might be here <laughs> for a long time. Anyway, praise God. I'm going to hand over to the worship team. Amen.